So I welcome you to worship on this Sunday, which is not only Memorial Day weekend, but it's also Trinity Sunday. So will you please stand if you're able and we'll join together in our opening prayer. God whose fingers sculpt sun and moon and curl the baby's ear, spirit brooding over chaos before the naming of the day, Savior sending us to earth's ends with water and words, by your grace you have shown us who you are. We glorify you as Trinity, even as we worship you as one. Open our hearts to receive your word to us today, that not only in our worship, but in our lives, we may serve and reflect your triune love. Amen. So our opening hymn, let's sing number 64, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. and I invite you to turn to those around you. Let's pass the peace of God to one another. Peace with you. Peace with you. Peace to you. You got these plans for the weekend. Peace to you. Oh. Peace to you. Very good. Yes. No pressure. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Joanne. Peace to you. Peace to you. You may be seated. And I invite you to look in your bulletins or on the screen as we read together our affirmation of faith. We belong to God, eternal and infinite, creator of all things and all that is to come. We follow Christ who comes to us from God and reveals God to us. He heals people and transforms lives and calls us to join in his ministry. He was crucified, died, and was raised by God and reigns over all creation. And he bids us to die and rise with him in the service of the healing of the world. We live by the Spirit, together with the communion of saints, as members of the body of Christ, God's holy universal church. We are confident in the forgiveness of sin, the power of resurrection, and the reality of eternal life. In all things, it is our desire to follow Christ by the grace of the Holy Spirit for God's glory. Amen. 
There are a number of announcements that I would like to call your attention to today. In, in your bulletin, you will see this little leaflet, this little envelope for Peace with Justice Sunday. This is one of the four special offerings that as United Methodists you have the opportunity to give to if you wish. This particular one goes to help with, with issues of, such as helping refugees. We know that there are thousands of refugees around the world who are displaced from their homes and they need everything. And so if you wish to give, some of this money will go globally to help with refugees. Some of it will actually stay right here in, in Iowa in our own annual conference. So, so um, if you would like to give for Peace to Justice Sunday offering, that envelope is for that. <coughs> We're going to have a summer Bible study that's not going to begin until, until June the 12th, um, but we're going to be looking at the Apostles' Creed, um, just section by section at the Apostles' Creed, so the books are already back there, and you're welcome to sign up for that. We will be having a study on Tuesday morning here and on Thursday morning at Little Cedar if you would like to participate. There are also our sign-up sheets in the back for Vacation Bible School. We need workers and we need some items. So you can check those lists and see if you can help in any way. Do you have other announcements for us today or joys and concerns that we should remember together? If not, then let's sing our prayer hymn, Let It Breathe On Me. and liberty and breath. We are so glad that we can gather here today just to breathe in you. We thank you for being our God and for loving us and for giving your life for us. And we thank you for persons that have shown your love to us in the ways that they have lived or the ways that they have died. We are so grateful for that. And we don't ever want to forget um, these examples of true love. We come to you as persons who do not always live as though we understand what loving you and loving other people is all about though. And so we ask your forgiveness for the times that we really messed that up. Help us by your grace to be people who really honor you and help other people through all that we do. We come to you on behalf of persons that might be in care centers or in hospice or in hospitals or at home feeling pain or sadness or worry. And we just ask that your presence be so close to them that you fill them with a sense of your joy and your peace. And we pray for those who are worried or feeling alone today or, or for those who don't have everything that they need. People around the world who don't have shelter, don't have peace, don't have work, don't have water. There are so many things that we need and we ask that you help us all to work together so a good life can be possible for everyone. We especially ask that you be with those who have had tragedies recently or in the past. Sometimes it takes so long to work through those tragedies and so we ask your special blessing to be with them. We ask that you help us as a congregation that we won't just be here, and that we won't just be busy, but that we will always be looking to you to see where it is that you are guiding us and where you need us to be, and help us by your grace then to go there. Now please hear us as together we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. 
to invite children to come for our time together. <laughs> I wanted to show you a really, really old picture. It's not a very good picture because it's sold and it's just a copy of a picture, but this is my great, great, great grandfather. When he was young, he was in the Civil War. Have you ever heard of the Civil War, right? And he fought on the side of the North, on the, on the side that was saying, we really don't think people should have to be slaves. We want people to be free. He didn't die in the Civil War, but lots of people did. Lots of people were willing to say, I care about freedom for everyone so much that I'd be willing to die for it, and some people did. I wanted to show you another picture. This is a picture that was taken before I was born, but it was in, in the uh, Omaha World Herald picture showing some of these people that had fought in the Civil War, and, and they still remember what it was like. This is my great-great-grandfather here, and you see all those, those things on his chest, right? Today and this weekend, we're remembering people that fought for us in different kinds of battles, 
because they wanted us to have freedom. And that's not something we take lightly, right? And so if you happen to go to the cemetery, maybe today or tomorrow, you might look around and see if you find any, any memorial stones that, that say this person actually was in the Civil War. And if you do, just stop a minute and just say, wow, thank you for them. But one thing I really want you to know is that something Jesus said. Jesus said, there is no greater love that anyone could show than this, that someone would give up their life for their friends. Right? And that's the kind of love that Jesus showed us because he gave up his life for us. So let's pray. Dear God, it's really good to remember people that were our ancestors and people that were willing to, to, to die so that other people could have freedom and could live. And so we want to remember that. We want to remember that you are the true author of life and freedom. So bless the memory of, of those and bless these children as they're making wonderful memories in their lives. In your name I pray, amen. Okay, you can get a clipboard. The blue one? Okay, here you go. scripture reading this morning is from John verse, uh, chapter 16 verses 4 to 15. The work of the Holy Spirit. I did not tell you these things at the beginning for I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me, yet none of you asks me where I'm going. And now that I have told you, your hearts are full of sadness. But I am telling you the truth. It's better for you that I go away because if I do not go, the helper will not come to you. But if I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove to the people of the world that they are wrong about sin and about what is right and about God's judgment. They are wrong about sin because they do not believe in me. They are wrong about what is right because I'm going to the Father and you will not see me anymore. And they are wrong about judgment because the ruler of this world has already been judged. I have much more to tell you, but now it would be too much for you to bear. When, however, the Spirit comes, who reveals the truth about God, he will lead you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but he will speak of what he hears and will tell you of what things to come. He will, he will give me glory because he will take what I say and tell it to you. All that my Father has is mine. That is why I said that the Spirit will take what I give him and tell it to you. This ends the reading. As our next hymn on this Trinity Sunday, let's sing Jesus, I Adore You. It's in the faith we sing or on the screen. It's number 2038. Father, I adore you. May my life be Today we're celebrating Trinity Sunday, and that word Trinity is probably a word that you've heard often, used often. It's, it's so commonly used for the names of churches or schools. The church that my family went to when I was a child was Trinity Church. One of the congregations that my husband serves right now is Trinity United Methodist Church in Bowen. 
the college where Don and I met each other for the first time was Trinity College in Chicago. So, so we're really familiar with this word Trinity. It just has this really good religious sound to it. And you know, really, what it really stands for is that there is unity in three, tri-unity, trinity. But did you know that this word trinity does not occur anywhere at all in the Bible? You can look it up in the concordance. As long as you want to, you're never going to find it because the word trinity does not occur in the Bible. A lot of the concepts that have gone into our understanding of what the Trinity is, those concepts you can find in the Bible, um, but it never comes right out and uses the word Trinity. So sometimes we get really confused about it because it is sort of a confusing thing. For example, if we're saying that, that we have the Trinity, we're saying that we have one God, but we know this one God as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and we're saying, well, how can that be? Actually, in the Old Testament times, for Jewish people, and continue to this very day, the number one statement of faith for Jewish persons is something found in Deuteronomy. It's called the Shema, and what it says is, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. This is so important that people recite it as the very first thing that they say when they wake up in the morning and it's the last thing that they pray before they go to bed at night. In a Jewish home, you will find these little mezuzahs attached to every doorway. And you, when you go through the door, you, you touch it. But what's inside it on a little slip of paper is this which says, Israel, remember this, the Lord and the Lord alone is our God. That's the Shema. The Shema is something that people will hear recited on the most holy of the holy days for Jewish people, on, on Yom Kippur. It's the center part of their worship service. It's part of their worship service every Sabbath day, sort of like we might repeat the Lord's Prayer every Saturday, or many churches might repeat the Apostles' Creed um, every worship service that we go to. It's, it's the thing that people hear at the moment when they die. Usually someone is there to recite these words over them, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And people that are Jewish uh, respect that so much that when they recite it, it's very common for them to put their hand over their face and cover their eyes out, as, out of a way of respect. Now, Jesus and his disciples were Jewish, so I'm absolutely certain that at least twice a day, Jesus and all of his disciples repeated that Shema. There are three times in the Gospels, in Matthew and Mark and Luke, that a story is told about a teacher of the law who comes to Jesus and asks Jesus, what do you think is the greatest commandment? And without blinking an eye, Jesus says, oh, it's hear, O Israel, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, because the Lord our God is one. And the teacher of the law said, excellent answer. Good job, Jesus. That's true. And Jesus, in response to that teacher of the law, said, you know, I think this guy is wise. I think he understands. So this is a foundation, not only of the Jewish faith, but of us as followers of Jesus to believe that God is one. And there are lots of passages in the Bible that talk about there being only one God. So, so, you know, a lot of times in the Old Testament when God will be getting frustrated with the children of Israel, it's because they're trying to worship all kinds of other gods and God said, I want you to, to worship only me. But Jesus would talk about this sometimes himself. So for example, in the prayer that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night that he's going to be arrested, and we call it his high priestly prayer, he's, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying for his followers and all of us who one day would follow him, and what he prays is he said, Lord, this is eternal life, that they would know you, the one true God. So re Jesus was very, very forthright in proclaiming that there is one God. And yet we know that in the New Testament, there are so many times when we hear about Jesus is the Son of God, or it'll come right out and say that Jesus is God, and, 
and they'll talk about the Holy Spirit, and there'll be passages that talk about the Spirit being God. And we think, well, how can this be? If there's only one God, this is kind of confusing. And yet, this idea that there's more than oneness in God is actually found in one of the names for God that is used so many times in the Old Testament. One of the names for God in Hebrew is Elohim, and Elohim is a plural noun, so really it means gods. So when the Bible tells stories, like the story of the creation, when Elohim says, let us create people in our own image, that's Elohim, a plural word for God. And it's Elohim that comes in the story about when Moses is standing at the burning bush and God speaks to him. It's this plural noun. And when we have the story of, of Jacob having this dream of this ladder that goes up to heaven and there's angels coming up and down the ladder and what's up at the top of the ladder is Elohim, this plural name for God which doesn't just happen once in a while in the Bible. If you were to count them, you would find it over 2,750 times in the Old Testament. We don't catch that because our translations of the Bible just translate it God, but it's a plural noun, but to confuse things often is used with just a singular verb. But we know that in Old Testament times that the Spirit of God is spoken of frequently. And the Spirit of God is talked about as being someone who will, will you know, just work in a very special way in the lives of leaders or prophets or kings. So we have stories about Samson being filled with God's Spirit so that he has the power to push down those, those pillars of the temple. And that David is filled with the Spirit of God so he can just sing and dance before the altar. Or that, you know, that Ezekiel is filled with the Spirit of God so that he can prophesy. So we do have the Spirit as God in the Old Testament. We even have a, a story about a time when someone was so filled with the Spirit of God, he could run so fast that he outran a horse and chariot and got to the destination first. So, so we do have stories of the Holy Spirit in, in the Old Testament as well. And Jesus and the New Testament often spoke of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, sort of in one breath. So, you know, like the passage that we read today, we have all of those separate things as if Jesus is saying, I've been here and now I'm going away and I'm going up to the Father and the Father will tell you what to do and the Holy Spirit will take care of you and so on. So, so we have this feeling of different persons and we know that one of the last instructions that Jesus gave to his church right before he left, which we call the Great Commission, was that Jesus said, I want you to go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then there's a passage in 1 Peter in which, in which it says, don't you know that we were chosen by God the Father and we were made holy by the Holy Spirit so that we could be obedient to Jesus Christ the Son who redeemed us through his blood. So it's very, very common in the New Testament to actually spell those all out as if they're together or, or even in the story of Jesus being baptized, right? Jesus. The Son of God is in the water, and the voice of God is booming from the clouds, and down comes the dove, landing like, you know, the Holy Spirit being present with Jesus. And so we have this idea of there being three persons, but one God, and it's really confusing. <laughs> For the first several centuries of Christianity, people just got more and more confused when they were talking about this. And sometimes people were getting to have some really ideas that some people thought, man, those don't seem very true to what the Bible has to say about God. And, and so there was a church father um, who coined the word the Trinity. This is about the second century after Christ. And, and he said, you know, if we have the Trinity, we can think of there being one God. The essence is God, but is in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But that's still 
confusing, right? Even though he set it out and, and people voted on it and said, okay, we voted and we've decided that if you're going to be a true Christian, this is what you'll believe. People haven't really understood. So, so people have through the years tried to come up with ways to explain it. So sometimes you will see something drawn like this. Well, that's a symbol that we use for the Holy Spirit to say, you know, it's kind of like a, a triketra where you might have this Venn diagram where, you know, there's three separate things, but, but when they're all put together, you can see that there's some points where, where they are all the same and then there's some difference. So, so there's that. Sometimes people will use an egg and they'll say, the Trinity is sort of like an egg. You know, an egg has a shell, and an egg has a yellow yolk, and it has an egg white that, you know, and the yolk is very different from the shell, which is very different from the egg white, but they're all egg. You can't draw these analogies too far out or you get really mixed up. And, and, but, but this is something that people sometimes use to explain the Trinity, or sometimes they'll say, you know, the Trinity is sort of like an apple. You know, here we have an apple, and the apple has this peeling on the outside, and inside you've got the nice white flesh of it, and then there's seeds, you know, and the seeds aren't the same as the skin at all, and yet all of this together is an apple. So the Trinity is sort of like that. Sometimes people will say, well, the Trinity is really sort of like H2O, you know? It's like, you know, you have H2O and that can be liquid as water that you drink or it can be solid like ice or it can be steam, but it's all H2O. The Trinity is sort of like that. Sometimes people will say, it's sort of like a pyramid, you know? A pyramid has, is three-dimensional, it has three separate sides, it's not just one plane, it's three separate sides, and each side is different, each side has its own plane, right? But, but all together they're a pyramid, and Trinity is sort of, kind of, like that. Someone that had a lot of trouble getting people to understand the Trinity um, was St. Patrick when he went to Ireland. And, the story says that one day he was out in the grass with people that didn't understand the Trinity and he happened to see a shamrock, so he picked it and he said, now look, you know, it's got one stem, but three separate leaves, that's sort of kind of like the Trinity. Um, but it still gets kind of confusing. And people sometimes will say, well, you know, it just doesn't really add up. If you have one God the Father and one God the Son, and one God the Spirit, and you're adding one plus one plus one together, you're not going to get one, you're going to get three. And we all would have to say, yeah, you're right, because one plus one plus one equals three. But people then who are trying to explain the Trinity might say, but you know, understanding the Trinity isn't really a math arithmetic adding problem, it's really a multiplication problem. It's like you've got this, this one God, you know, and, and you have God the Father, and you, you multiply that by one God the Son, and you multiply that by one God the Spirit, and what do you have when you multiply one by one by one? You get one. It, it's sort of, kind of like that. And yet, it's really still very confusing. And, and we can really get messed up if we take any one of those analogies too far. Because it's sort of a mystery, and yet it's sort of wonderful as well. One of the illustrations that people sometimes are using nowadays to explain it is an illustration that kind of looks like this, where you have a triangle and each point of the triangle is one of the persons of God. So you have God the Father and you have God the Son and you have God the Spirit. But then they want to make sure that we understand that the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father, that the Father is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father, and the Spirit is not the Son, and that they are distinct, unique persons. So we have three persons, but they all have the same essence, and the essence of them all is that they all are divinity. They all are God. And I think this can make some sense just to us and who we are. What is the essence of us? Our essence is human beings. That's our essence, right? We have DNA, we have bones, we have skin, we have breath, we have lungs, we, we live here on earth. We have the essence of being, in essence, human beings. But as human beings, 
we are all different persons. I'm different from you, you're different from you. We're all different persons, but in essence, we're all the same too. So what the church fathers wanted us to think about God is to say that God is one essence, but three persons. That the essence is sort of what God is. God is divine and that the persons are who God is. God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if we think about all of these persons being divine, we might need to ask, well, what are the attributes of divinity? And I think the Bible shows us that for all three of these persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we see that they are eternal, that they have existed before all time, they will exist forever, there's no beginning or no end to them, they are eternal. And that all three of these persons are divine and that they are all knowing, they know everything. And that these persons are all divine in that they are present everywhere, omnipresent, that they are everywhere, and, and that they all are divine in that they deserve glory and honor and that they all do the work of the divine, which is the work of, of creativity, the work of showing love, the work of, of having the presence of God be right with us. They all have these attributes. But then if we look at the individual persons of the Godhead, we see that there are some ways in which they are different. And so, like the passage that we read today from John and other passages will say, you know, we've got God the Father, who's really the one with ultimate authority. Jesus would often say, not my will, but what my Father wants to be done, that's what I will do. God has the ultimate authority, he has ultimate power, and he is total love, and he's totally good. That's God the Father. And then we have God the Son, who is the one that, that came down. <laughs> to be on earth with us, to really to be, to be the word of God and the presence of God with us in the flesh, right? To really to, to speak for God and help us to know God's love right, right here and now. And then we have the Holy Spirit who is the one who comforts us, who gives us encouragement and courage, who, who's the one that convicts us when we're doing things that are wrong and gives us a conscience and makes us pay attention to the conscience and who guides us in the way of life and who helps us understand the truths about God. We have this Holy Spirit that breathes life into us so that we can live. We have all of these things when we talk about God. But if you were to ask, well, you know, really, basically, what on earth is God doing? Well, I think when you look at all of these things, it seems to me that what God is doing is actually God is in the business of relationship. God is busy relating. He's busy relating to the other persons and the Godhead, and he's busy relating to us. And everything that God has ever said and done has always been so that we can have this perfect relationship, which he invites us into. And the reason that Jesus had to come is because we broke that perfect relationship and Jesus had to come to restore it again and the Holy Spirit comes so that we can live in relationship that's at one with God and at one with other people. You know, when Jesus was explaining to that teacher of the law what it means to say, the Lord our God is one, he said, then you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. And I think that's why the Trinity is so important. Because when you live it out, it's really all about relationship. The relationship that God wants with you because he loves you. He sent Jesus to show you that love. He sent the Spirit so that you can live out that love. So let's thank God today for the Trinity. In one of our newer hymnals, which we don't have copies yet for the pews, but we made copies for you in your bulletin, is a song that really sings about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and then the Trinity. So I invite you to stand if you're able as we sing together from the insert or the words are on the screen, Eternal God Transcending Time. <laughs>
invite our ushers for our offerings. offerings as a way to worship and honor you. We want other people to know your love, and so please bless these gifts and use them for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Will you please join me in reading the words of the benediction, and then following that we will sing our recessional hymn, Sent Forth by God's Blessing. Let's read the benediction together. Holy Trinity, outgoing, sending, send us in your name and in your image. Grow in us your delight in otherness, difference, and variety. Inspire in us your unity of loving purpose. Instill in us your joy in receiving and giving. Inspire in us determination to stay in covenant with you and with each other. Build between us relationships that practice peace and grow in us the courage to risk reaching out in love. Amen. Amen. 